Okay. So, hey, everybody. I want to thank you all so much for coming today. It's really nice to see you here. Um, before we get started, I've been asked to do a little housekeeping and remind you all to please mute your phones if you haven't already done that. And also, if you'd be so kind as to please fill out the survey at the end, that would be great. On behalf of all the speakers at GDC, we do take your feedback to heart. So thank you in advance for that. We really appreciate it. So with all that out of the way, I should take a minute to introduce myself. My name is Amy Dallas. I am one of the four co-founders of Clutch Play Games out of Portland, Oregon. And I'm also on the board of directors of OGO, which is the Oregon Games Organization. So I got to say, it's a really big honor to be here today representing both Clutch Play and OGO on a subject that I think is becoming increasingly important, especially for indies in the mobile space. And that's this question of how do we keep our businesses afloat given the volatility of the mobile games market at this point in time? I don't think it's a big secret here when I say that uh, it's becoming a lot harder to make a living solely from game revenues as an indie developer. At least it has been for the last couple of years. So what do we do about that? What are our options? So one option is we just say, screw it. We know this is risky. We're just going to double down. We're going to make as many games as possible, as efficiently as possible, and hope that at least one or more of them is going to produce enough revenue to keep us going. That's an option. We can do that. Option two, we can look for more predictable ways to bring in income, such as contracting. We can just turn our back on all that risk and just say, all right, we're going to become a contract studio, and that's how we're going to make our money. Or option three is we do some combination of both. We juggle the chainsaws and we find a way to make that work. So I got to say, I've been on both sides of this equation. I've been on all sides of it, as a matter of fact. And I don't think there are any right or wrong answers, to be perfectly honest. I think uh, there are a lot of uh, hard questions. This is a hard question to answer. And I don't think there are any right or wrong answers here. What it, essentially this boils down to is a math problem. Mm. Excuse me, I have anxiety dry mouth here. Um, so essentially, this is a math problem, and because it's a math problem, unfortunately for me, that means I'm going to have to do some math in front of a live studio audience, which is a little bit horrifying for me, I'm going to be honest with you. This is a little bit like one of those anxiety dreams, like, oh my gosh, I'm back in high school and I forgot to wear clothes. How did this happen? This is mortifying. But I'm actually, uh, I'm going to throw myself on that grenade because I think it's really important. So if nothing else, at least you can hopefully find some amusement in my discomfort. So there is that. So anyway, so let's get started. Um, to give you a little background on Clutch Play, uh, Clutch Play was founded back in early 2012. And like a lot of indies, we do divide our time pretty evenly between doing work for hire and developing our own titles. So again, we're, we're juggling the chainsaws there. And uh, in terms of our clients, we have a lot of really cool clients we work with um, all over the country. Some of them are actually down here in San Francisco in the Bay Area. We've got Kixi, Telltale, we work with Intel, and another, a, a, a number of other really cool companies. It's been a really great experience um, doing that kind of work, and we've had a chance to work on a lot of really great products. But our first love, of course, is doing our own games. And as far as our own games go, we have a couple that are out there and one in development. Our first one is a game called Little Chomp. And I'm going to talk about that in a couple minutes in some detail because I think it's a great example of uh, a critical success and a financial failure. So I'm going to look at that in a little more detail. Our second game is a game called Skullduggery. And Skullduggery actually did pretty well. I've got to say, I'm not at all unhappy with how it did. I think by a lot of indie standards, it would be considered a success because it was a really expensive game and we did make our money back. But I think that that's a big problem with a lot of indies is that we often confuse breaking even with success. And from a business standpoint, that's just not the case. If we're looking to be successful, we're looking for at least a two to three uh, re time return of, on investment for our games. So a break-even is, is not a great option, but certainly, given how expensive it was, I, I can't complain about it. So then we have another game that's coming out in uh, uh, the next year. So we'll talk about that at another point. So I want to start off... Pardon me. By talking a little bit about Little Chomp, because I think it's a really good case study, as I mentioned before, for what can happen when you don't have a success. So normally, I actually don't share specific information about game revenues. I just don't. But in this case, I'm going to make an exception, because so often in mobile, when a team shares information about revenues, it's usually a success story. So it's really hard to gauge what is, it, what is a, a typical um, uh, kind of failure look like. 
So let's look at that. So here we go. We're going to do a little bit of math here. So Little Chomp was our first game, and uh, we wanted to keep our costs low. So at the time, we were a team of four people. So we tried to keep our development amongst the four of us. So that was four people working for about 10 months. So that comes out to 40 weeks, working about 40 hours a week, usually more. But for the sake of argument, let's just actually say 40. So that comes out to about 1,600 hours, uh, 40 hours a week times uh, 40 weeks, 1,600 hours per developer times four developers. So that comes out to 6,400 hours total. So that's not an insignificant amount of time. So let's look at what that actually turned into in terms of revenue. So our total revenue for that 6,400 hours turned out to be 10K. So when you break that down, this is the sad math here, when you break that down per partner, so that's $2,500 per person, and when you divide that by 1,600 hours, the revenue comes out to about $1.56 per hour. So just out of just sheer perverse interest, I actually did a Google search on what was minimum wage in Oregon in 2012. And as you can see, minimum wage was 880. So unfortunately, <laughs> we made $7.24 less than we would have if we were working a minimum wage job. So there's, there's, a, there's failure, and then there's poverty level failure. So given that most of us aren't in a position to live on poverty level wages, that brings us to the big question, uh, you know, what do you, what do you do in those circumstances? And this is actually how we found ourselves uh, going down the contracting route. So at a larger level, let's talk about why it's so hard to make a living on mobile right now. So last year, I did a talk here at GDC called Free-to-Play versus Premium, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, where I looked at some of the pros and cons of both Free-to-Play and Premium, and I think some of those conversation points are really relevant here today. Let's talk about Premium first. So I think there are a lot of people who think that Premium is dead. It's just not a good model. It's being choked to death by Free-to-Play, and I understand where everybody's coming from. I actually think that premium is really a viable option for a lot of indies. Um, as I said, we did reasonably well with that on Skullduggery. But there are some obvious downsides. It's an inherently smaller market. And as an industry, we've kind of trained our players to not want to pay us for the entertainment that we make for them up front. And there are so many free-to-play options. Most people feel like they, they don't have to pay up front for something when they can just get something else for free. So there's an inherently a smaller number of people who are willing to do that. And then there's the fact that there's also a, a smaller potential of revenue. So one of the great things about free-to-play is over the lifespan of your game, you have the potential to make tens, hundreds, thousands of dollars off a single player over the span of your game. With premium, not so much. So of the people who are willing to spend money on premium, generally they do so because they like the fact that they've paid once and you're not bugging them constantly to give them more money. So if you're charging, for example, $5 for a game, then you, your ability to make money is limited by the number of people who will actually give you $5. Another challenge of premium is that the long tail is really not so long. So if you think of premium uh, like a Hollywood movie, that's, I think, a very good analogy. In Hollywood, I think they often consider success a great opening weekend because they understand that after the hype of that opening weekend, the sales are going to taper off. So if you don't come out of the gate pretty strong with premium, it's very unlikely that you're going to have some huge spike of sales later on. It, it's possible, but not too likely. And it usually coincides with you releasing more content, which is expensive. So you may make more money, but you obviously have to spend more money to get it. And then, of course, there's the issue of piracy. So piracy is a big problem, obviously, in premium. For our first game, Little Chomp, we ran some numbers last year, and we found that of uh, every, for every one person who would pay us a dollar, over 150 people would just pirate the game. And so you'd think, okay, well, iOS, that's going to be a lot better. It's a closed system, much harder to pirate. And yet we found on Skullduggery that at least a third of our players that were playing the game were actually also pirating. So at $5 a copy, that's a pretty significant loss. So that certainly makes free-to-play a lot more attractive, right? Everybody's heard all the, the great things about free-to-play. 
But the reality of free-to-play is that it's a market dominated by large companies with deep pockets. So in my talk last year, I cited a research uh, uh, paper that was actually done by a company called Midia. And in it, they looked at 700 apps that, um, on the App Store, top grossing on App Store and Google Play. And of those 700 apps, they found that 81% were produced by the same 50 companies. And this graphic is actually a, a perfect representation of the fact that this is, this is still happening. So on the left, you have App Store top grossing from March of last year. And on the right, you have App Store top grossing for March of this year. And as you can see, it's mostly the same titles or it's different titles by the same companies. So clearly that is still the case. So some other challenges that indies have in mobile is obviously discoverability. Um, we're all competing for the same set of eyeballs, but we don't have the deep pockets that larger companies have. And success is often dependent on factors that are completely outside of our control. And I do a lot of work with other indie studios, and there's one example recently of uh, some people I know who did an amazing job. They made a really great game. It was really quirky and funny and weird. And uh, they got some amazing press. It really captured the imagination, not only of the games press, but of the mainstream press. And yet, unfortunately, that didn't actually translate to dollars. So you can do everything right, and things may still not quite work out for you. So where does that leave us? We've just spent a lot of time talking about how risky it is as a studio to put all your eggs in the original IP basket. So as indies, how do we get out in front of that? What do we do? And I've got to say, the only way that I know how to get out in front of that is with quantifiable data. And that means we have to start asking ourselves some pretty hard questions. So I think most of these are pretty self-explanatory, but to just kind of spin through these, um, you need to figure out how much you need as an individual to keep going in your indie studio, how much your other uh, employees need or, or co-founders. So what are the overall company financial needs? How much money do you need to actually complete the product that you want to make? How much potential is there once you've completed it in terms of sales? Like how big is your market? And then of course, how much money is available that I have right now to actually make the game that I want to make? So as you start to answer all these questions, it begins to form a picture that essentially turns into a projected P&L. And this is a profit and loss statement, of course. I'm sure most of you know what that is. And that's going to allow you to track how much money you're actually making or losing at any given time on any of your projects. And this is a really critical step to understanding your ability to become or remain profitable as a company. But it's kind of amazing to me how many indies don't actually do that. They just gloss right over this. So I want to talk a little bit about Indie Budgeting 101. One of the big fallacies of Indie Budgeting is that budgets consist almost entirely of external costs. So I find, I've had this conversation about 12 times since I've been here at GDC, and I haven't even been here that long, asking people, well, what are your budgets? And they're like, well, my, my engineers cost this, or my artists cost that, and that's the extent of what they think their budget is. And, and it's very much the opposite of that. So if there's nothing you take away from this talk, let it be this. The bulk of your internal dev costs, that is essentially most of your budget, which means you have to figure out what your time is actually worth. That's a really big issue. So again, I do a lot of mentoring with indie studios, and I get asked a lot, well, how do you figure out what your baseline indie hourly rate should be? And there's a couple ways that you can go about this. You can actually go to the low end and ask yourself, okay, well, what is the minimum amount we need to get by to pay ourselves for the duration of the project or for a given year? And then you plug that number into your budget and you say, okay, well, that's, that's my budget plus whatever external costs I have. But that's not necessarily the best indicator because, again, you're kind of living in that world of the lowest common denominator. What is the minimum amount I can get? So there are other ways you can look at this. Um, a different way you can cut it is, is looking at the top end. How much money can I potentially make given my skills and experience? So in other words, if I decide to give up my indie dreams and go back to being a producer at EA, which I once was, I know how much I can make doing that. It's probably at least a six figure, well, it's definitely at least a, a six figure job. So if I know I can make six figures elsewhere, I can say, well, okay, then my potential worth is, is 
$100,000. So my budget is my time plus everybody else's time plus external costs at a rate of $100,000 per year. So the problem there is that it's going to make your budget look enormous. It's going to be, uh, it's going to make it look like you can't afford to make your own game. So there's a third option, and that is taking that high end, here's how much I'm able to make, and subtracting the amount that you're willing to invest for doing something you love with a potential upside. So for example, if I can make 100,000 at EA, and I maybe need 30,000 or 50,000 to live as an indie, the middle ground maybe is, I, my, my rate is 75000 because there's $25,000 worth of value in actually being able to do the kind of work I love and make a game that potentially could make some additional money. So once you've figured all that out, your value, as an indie studio, and you figured out your budget, what then? What happens if you figure out, okay, well, I know how much money I need, but I don't have that. What do I do? So there are a couple of options. Looking for investment is one. That can take the form of either uh, uh, an angel investor, a family member, uh, crowdfunding. All of these things are options. You can look for a publisher. But I've got to say, options one and two are a little thin on the ground at the moment. If you're looking for an actual company to invest in you or a publisher, right now, given the state of mobile, as we just talked about, it's a little bit up and down. So there's a lot less of those opportunities. So a really good option, as I mentioned, and has been for us, is doing work for hire. So let's talk about the benefits of work for hire. And I'm not necessarily talking about individual work for hire. I'm talking about hiring out your entire studio as a development team to work with an external company. So a lot of the, the good things about that is it's a predictable source of income. Unless something goes horribly wrong, you're going to get paid regardless of whether or not the project is a huge success because you're, you're working on an hourly basis or a per project basis. Another benefit is you have the potential to pay yourself what you're actually worth. So you can go on the high end of, of your scale. Generally speaking, in our case, uh, we do tend to pay ourselves more when we're doing work for hire because we're not doing the kind of work that we, we do necessarily want to do all the time. So again, we're, we're removing that, that, uh, that value of that middle step. So there's also learning opportunities and a lot of opportunities for growth as a company. So on a lot of the projects that we've worked on, we've learned things that have helped us in our own development. So that's actually been incredibly valuable to us. And it's also allowed us to grow as a company, bring on more people. And of course, as you bring on more people, that means more profit. And it enables you to put more money away towards doing your own development. We started late, so I'm about to get the hook here. Um, so the downsides of work for hire is obviously it's less creative control. You've got a lower ceiling of return. You're going to make the money that you were promised, but you're not going to necessarily make a huge amount more because it's not your project. And it actually might take more money than you realize. So let's run some numbers. Let's say our team of four does want to make $100,000 because we're doing contract work. So I actually had this argument with someone on my team not too long ago. He was saying, well, okay, well, all we need to do is make, if we want to pay ourselves, you know, $100,000, there's four of us, let's just make $400,000 in contract work, and we're good, right? So that makes sense. Except it's not that simple, because there are other factors to be, to be factored in. So you've got payroll taxes. As you can see, that's about 10%. You've got benefits. That's another 10%. So tack on 20% to your 400 grand. That puts you up to 500 and there's actually even more. So generally speaking, you've got a lot of business expenses. You've got contract labor, legal, marketing. In some cases, when you're actually doing work for hire, you might have corporate insurance that you have to pay for, like errors and omission insurance. So all of these things, there's a whole bunch of costs associated with that that you have to actually add on top of that. And then you also have taxes. So to pay yourself a salary of $100,000, you're really looking at having to make almost double that, maybe a little more than that. So obviously, that is a big factor. Pardon me. So where does that leave us? So I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this. It's Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Uh, it was put out there by Abraham Maslow in a paper in the 1940s called The Theory of Human Motivation. And in it, he establishes that as human beings, we all have these, these, these essential needs. 
And at the bottom, we have our foundational needs of physiological, which is food, water, shelter, breathing, everything it takes to just stay alive. And then on top of that, we have safety and security. So do we actually feel safe enough to, to uh, be creative, for example? It's hard to be creative when you're afraid that you're going to lose your home or not have enough food to eat. So the idea here is that you have to actually meet all of your needs at these lower levels of the pyramid in order to achieve the higher levels such as creativity and self-actualization. And fear of not meeting those basic needs can actually really hamper your creativity. So again, this goes back to the question of how do we ensure our basic needs are met while still doing the work we love? And do we contract or do we not? And I think in our case, we've decided to do both and it's worked out really well for us. So I probably don't have a lot of time. Does anybody have any questions? I can maybe take one. Go for it. Hey. Uh, I think so. Okay. Uh, we've been doing like work for hire and original SIP. Oh, there we go. Uh, for quite a while. Uh, I wanted to know if you have any suggestions. Like we've been doing work for hire and like freelancing websites, and they tend to be like really small or only like for a programmer or two programmers, and we, we haven't had a chance to get like the whole studio working in Work for Hire. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions how do you can make that transition or so to say? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, it sort of depends on what your pipeline is for sales. We specifically go after jobs that we know are larger because we don't want to piecemeal our team out. And that's one of the biggest challenges of actually being a work for hire team is that we want to keep our team all together because you do run the risk of if you, if you have a few people hired out here and there, then you, your team isn't really your team anymore. It's just a stable of contractors that you're, you're uh, sort of hiring out. Yeah. And so it's really going after the, the size of jobs. You said you're doing actually web development or game uh, development? No, no, mobile development. No, no, games. Games, games. Yeah. okay. Mobile games. But we, we use like Upwork and Freelancer and there's only like smaller jobs. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's actually not always a, a good way to get contract work. You really want to get into larger companies and find the people who are actually doing outsourcing and put together a pitch deck with all of your information, all the information about your team, what you can do as a team, what your team capabilities are. And there are a lot of companies right now looking for really good outsourcing. So that is really the way to get your whole team together is pitch yourself as a team to companies directly. Okay. Can you tell me the companies after? What was that? So, so, can you tell me some of the companies after? <laughs> we'll talk. I'll give okay, you my card. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? When you're doing work for hire, what kind of margins do you shoot for? Like, oh, what do you decide is, is worth your time and what isn't? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, like I said, we do tend to go towards the higher end of our scale. So we have a scale that we pay ourselves or we budget ourselves for when we're doing work for hire. Um, that's on the lower end. On the higher end, we do want to take on jobs that will allow us not only to pay ourselves at a pretty high rate, but also put some money aside. So uh, at, at a minimum, 30% is the minimum and, and going up from there. And what kind of domains are you working in? Like, is, is it always in games or do you do like we do. banks or marketing or? Yeah, we do a little bit of both. Well, so we do primarily work in games. We have done some app development as well. And in some cases we've done marketing and, and things of that nature, some PR. It's really, uh, it depends on what's going on. Obviously, with your sales cycle, you want to make sure that everybody is working. So if maybe you see somebody is, you know, not everybody is working at the same rate all the time on all projects. So, for example, if there's somebody on the team who is not as busy and they can actually pick up a small project, then we would actually put them on a smaller project for a short period of time. One other thing I want to mention about work for hire is that when you're... Figuring out what your costs are and work for hire, what you're going to charge, it really depends on the kind of work that you're actually doing. So, for example, we do everything from creative development from scratch to firefighting. And short-term firefighting is always going to be our highest rate because it's, it's intense. You have to run in, hit the ground running really fast. And uh, it's usually short-term. So if there's, if there's a heavy ramp, it requires a high skill set, and it's a short duration of time, you're going to want to get as much from that as you can. 
If it's a longer project that's creative and it has a really long runway, you can actually afford to charge a little bit less. So we sort of scale that way as well. And does that require full-time biz dev, like a full-time biz dev person, or do you have a, a network where work sort of comes to you? Uh, a little bit of both. So I am the full-time dev, biz dev person, but I'm full-time, I say that kind of somewhat tongue-in-cheek, because I also do work along with the team. So really, I think one of the best things to do when you're, uh, one of the best ways to get work, once you actually get in and start working with larger companies um, and people see that you do good work, you know, as we all know, we move around quite a lot in the games industry, and so we found that one of the ways we've gotten repeat clients is as people we've worked with have gone to other companies, they will call us and say, oh, those guys are great, bring them in. And so really your own good work is the best way to, to put your name out there and market yourself, and, and that's certainly been our experience. But yes, I do a lot of biz dev. My plate is very full here at GDC doing just that, so if you're looking to do biz dev, this is, you are at the right place, certainly, so. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? I think we're good. I'm getting the, I'm getting the hook. All right, thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>